The Pint of Science, brought to you by the Faculty of Science, Charles University in Prague, Department of Chemistry, sponsored by the Pilsner Brewery. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. My name is Lizzy Michek. I'm from here, from the Department of Organic Chemistry. And uh, I would like to tell you a story today. Uh, I want to start off with this, this picture of this lady. Uh, her name is... Uh, Jean-Louis Colmage, she's French, and as you can tell from the, from the name, and uh, in this picture she's 20 years old, and this picture was taken in 1895, and in this picture, this is the, this is the same lady, 100 years later, when she was celebrating 121st birthday, and uh, the picture was taken in 19... Uh, 96, and she passed away a year later uh, when she was 122, and she's the oldest well-documented uh, person that ever lived on Earth. And her story is uh, is quite amazing. She was born in South of France in Arles. Uh, she knew personally Vincent van Gogh, the, the painter, and uh, she was quite vital when she was 85. She took up fencing classes and she rode bikes until she was 100 years old. And the good news for, uh, for the smokers in the audience is that she quit smoking when she was 117 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and she, stopped, and she, she, she started smoking when she was 21. <laughs> and uh, while I'm talking about this, uh, it's truly exceptional in terms of longevity and the, and the lifespan of, of humans. But I'm talking about it because um, we will, for sure, in the future, we will see more stories like that because uh, humans, life, the life expectancy of humans is progressively increasing and we are staying in shape until, until older age. Uh, and here you can see the, the, the evolution of the life, expect, life expectancy over the last 500 years. Roughly, and you can see it was for a long time it was oscillating around 40, 40 years, and then in the mid 90s, with the inception of modern science and technology, it's it started grow rapidly, and um, it's growing ever since. And this raises interesting questions like uh, how far can we go? What are the limits? And can we actually slow down or even stop aging, or or why do we age at all? And what is the cost of aging? And the simple answer to these questions is that we just don't know. Uh, in this table, I just I just want to I just want to briefly mention this is the this, this is the list of the major cause of death in the states in 2014. And if you uh, if you look at the list and if you if you leave out this chronic lower respiratory diseases, which is mainly due to smoking and the unintentional injuries, all of them the heart diseases, cancer stroke and Alzheimer's disease, they are all age or aging related. And uh, it's projected that for instance, Alzheimer's disease will become, in, in a couple of decades, this will become a major cause of, cause of death. There is no cure for that. In the case of cancer, cancer is also on the rise. And uh, there, there's been some improvements in the treatment, but still there are for instance, uh, lung cancer, which is the second the most common cancer, the life expect the five year life not life expectancy, the five year survival rate is around is some somewhere between the five and ten percent, and it has not changed in the last forty years. So obviously there are new ideas needed, and one of the think outside of, think outside of the box idea is that. Uh, why just don't we slow down the aging? As I said, all, all, all these diseases are aging related, so if we slow down the aging process, then uh, we, can, we, can basically, we can basically target all the, all, the diseases, all the diseases at once. It will be sort of a systemic approach to, uh, to somehow manage these diseases. Uh, and, uh, however, the obvious question is how how, how do we go about it? How do we do? How do we slow down the aging process? And here I have the the proverb, old Czech proverb that you might know from uh, from your grandmas. I didn't find the right uh, 
in English proper English equivalent, but it basically means that if you don't eat too much and if, if you don't drink and eat too much, you will live long. That's, that's, that's basically the message. And actually, it is, it is the first... I think our sponsors might object. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you don't eat too much. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is actually the first scientifically proven approach to slow down aging and increase the life expectancy. It is now called the dietary restriction or caloric restriction. And for instance, in rats, if you feed rats with just 70% of the food that what they, they would normally eat, you can increase the life expectancy by up to 50%, which is, which is pretty remarkable. And we still don't know what the exact mechanism of this, uh, of this dietary restriction phenomenon is, but there are some, there are some path pathways that are, that are popping up that seems to be mm, important in this, in this phenotype. And here are the, the, the two of them that have been identified recently. And it's the growth hormone insulin-like, or uh, IGF-1 signaling pathway and the mTOR signaling pathway. And for instance, um, you, can, uh, you can genetically, in, in mice, you can genetically engineer them in the way that they actually uh, express a low, lower levels of the hormones. It's these two pathways. If you if you suppress them, if you if you if you decrease the signaling of these pathways, this leads to a life extension phenotype. And in uh, in mice, if you if you downregulate the, the growth hormone again, you can uh, you can go up to fifty percent uh, increase in the survival. Which is if you translate it to humans, this would be like. 40 extra 40 years on top of the 80, 80 years that is the average life expect expectancy and that's uh, who wouldn't want that right uh, and the mTOR signaling is, is another pathway that, is, that seems to have a similar effect on the on the longevity and uh, slowing down aging and interesting, it, interestingly there are already drugs approved on the market that seems to be signaling these two pathways, and one of them is the metformin that is shown here, which is the, which is a drug for a type two diabetes, and the uh, rapamycin, uh, which is significantly more complex, and it's a drug for uh, for immunosuppression. When when you get a transplant, that you will get a rapamycin in order to uh, to prevent the rejection of the transplant. And these two drugs, they, in, in, in the animal models, they seem to mimic the effect of the dietary restriction. So if you, if you feed them to animal models, you, know, you can significantly, significantly slow down aging and extend lifespan of, of, of the model organisms. And it was shown in, uh, in rats, in mice, in monkeys. And uh, these two molecules, they are now actually heading into a clinical trials on humans. I think the rapamycin clinical trial has been started this year. And the aim is to, for the, for the very first time, the aim is to just uh, come up with a pill that will slow down aging in humans. And we will see uh, how it will play out. Hopefully, hopefully it will be okay. Um, do, do you know what this is? This is the second, second woman in, the, in my presentation. And her name is, uh, uh, what her name, uh, she's, a, she's, a, she's a Countess of Bathory, you, you, probably, you probably know, and her story is much less, uh, much less optimistic than the first lady, she was, she was the, one of the most prolific serial killer in the medieval Europe, and it is estimated that she killed up to 200 of her female, young female servants. In the castle of Chakchisa, which is now in uh, in Nabi Slovakia, right? Uh, and the legend says that she was taking bath in the blood of the of the young young female servants in order to retain or to retain her youth, in order to stay to stay young. And uh, it is just a legend, of course, but as as crazy and as uh, as creepy it sounds. Uh, there were some recent reports, very recent reports, that if you take an old mouse, 
and inject her with the blood or blood plasma of a young mouse, this can lead to 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 an effect like a vascular vascular remodeling or neurogenesis, and this is associated with the improvement in the cognitive skills like learning learning skills and, and memory. So so obviously. There's, there's something going on. I'm, I'm, with this, I'm not suggesting that the older members of the faculty should be bowed in the blood of their students. Right? <laughs> although, although I think that the many students think that this was exactly the I do with their students. But <laughs> what I want to say, what I want to say is that that, uh, that there are like really un unexpected and surprising and actually exciting uh, things going on now in the in the aging research and uh, with this, this this basically says that the, the, the brains or the brain cells of at least at least mice they they have an intrin intrinsic capability of, of re renewal of rejuvenation you just uh, of rejuvenation you just need to give them the right right trigger and we, we don't know what the triggers are but uh, but uh, it's uh, I think it's really 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 exciting. What uh, what we do in, in my lab? Uh, we are trying to we are chemists, so we are trying to uh, develop tools, chemical tools to monitor activity of the enzymes that are believed to be involved in the pathways related <coughs> to, to aging. And uh, one of the enzymes. Uh, one of the enzymes is a methionine sulfoxide reductase, and what it does, it basically reduces the sulfoxide back to back to sulfide. When you have a when you have proteins, you have a you have a methionine side chains, and they can get oxidized um, with the react, so-called reactive oxygen species, and they they get oxidized through corresponding sulfoxide. And the, the the task of the of the methionine sulfoxide reductase is to fix this oxidative damage and to Revert it and restore the, the natural, natural methionine. And uh, as there is a lot of chemists in the audience, uh, you you've probably noticed that the, the, the sulfoxide are chiral. They can exist as the S, S enantiomer or the R enantiomer, and nature has evolved two uh, distinct classes uh, of the of the reductase A, which reduces the S isomer, and B, which reduces, which reduces the the uh, the R isomer. And when we entered the field, when I started my lab well, last year, there was there was there was there was no way to, to monitor. Uh, first of all, uh, why is it important and how is it uh, how is it linked to a, to an aging? There was a there was a, there was a report in 2002 and, and other reports later that if you if you take a Drosophila fruit flies, which is a common aging model. Uh, and the and the lifespan, average lifespan of the of the wild type is roughly fifty five days. If you increase the activity of the methionine sulfoxide reductase A enzyme, the, you can you can almost double the average lifespan of the of the of the fruit fly. And if you surprisingly, if you uh, if you overexpress the B and the, the B reductase, which is R selective, there is there is no effect. So. Doubling the lifespan of an organism is obviously very, very, very interesting in fact. By the way, this, this, this is my this is not a five years old drawing, this is my own artistic depiction of it. <laughs> <laughs> and as I said, when, when we entered the field, there was no easy way to, to monitor the activity of the of, of, of this enzyme that seems to be related to longe longevity, at least in the Rosella. <coughs> So what we try to do, we try to do, we try to develop a tools and tools and control that would actually monitor the activity of the enzyme, and we we came up with this with this molecule, which we call as sulfox one, and indeed you can you can you can monitor the activity of the methionine sulfoxaturase A uh, with this enzyme just simply uh, through the through the color change of the here's the bright field, and also there is an associated color change in the fluorescence. So this is the very first probe that can that can, that can target this this enzyme. And we also show that you can you can monitor the enzyme in vivo uh, using the using the using the bacterial cells. Uh, it was it was known that the, the stress bacteria that you have a uh, that you have a higher higher expression of, the, of this particular enzyme. So we we took a population of the happy bacteria and the stress bacteria incubated with the probe. 
and image it with the microscope, and from the images you can you can clearly see that there is a, there is a marked difference, and that that's again the first uh, the first uh, the first probe that can that can do that in vivo in, in organisms, and the obvious the obvious future direction is to is to use it on the eukaryotic or human cells, and what we would like to do is that. We would like to develop a high throughput assay for a, for a compound library screen. We would have cells, our probe, and a library of compounds, and we'll be looking for a compound that increases the activity of the enzyme. And uh, the obvious question then with, with such a drug-like molecule is that if we can actually pharmacologically recapitulate the, the life extension phenotype that was seen with the genetically engineered organisms and, and extend it perhaps to mammals or, or, or maybe humans. And maybe sometime in the future, we'll just take a pill a day and we will live long and prosper. <laughs> and thank you for your attention.